Chapter 21. Expecting Indians. When I first arrived, I was expecting Indians. Maybe not like those in dime novels or in James Fenimore Cooper's stories about the Mohicans. But real Indians. People way different from the kids I'd gone to school with. I never envisioned what I did find here at Chilagi. Full-blood Indians, Indian-looking boys and girls with black hair and brown skin, make up only about four of every ten students. The next big group are mixed bloods, kids with only one Indian parent who tend to be lighter skinned, lighter haired. They are real sensitive whenever a full blood says they're not real Indians. Then there are the white kids. All of them have some Indian ancestry, or claim to. All of them are on the tribal rolls of one Indian nation or another. Most are from one of the historic communities that were reservations before allotment and the Oklahoma land rushes. A bunch of them look real white, blonde-haired and blue-eyed white. They're the ones who get called Stahitki, white boy, by some of us Creeks. Us Creeks? I just said that, didn't I? Some of those white-looking Indian kids grew up thinking of themselves as Indians, maybe even speaking some of the language. Me, I grew up just thinking of myself as a person. Being white means you have the luxury to do that. It means not worrying about who you are. You know your identity, even if you're a hobo. It also means, outside of an Indian school, not being told you don't belong if you, don't, if you have light skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes. Like what happens almost every day with Tommy Wilson. White looking, he calls himself Creek. He grew up on historic Creek land. His father, like Pop, is full blood and went to Chilagi. Then he married a Norwegian lady. Tommy sits next to me in Mrs. Teague's class. Tommy is a good kid. My first Monday at Chilagi, he greeted me in the hallway. Welcome to Indian hell, he said. So you're Muskogee, eh? I nodded. Tommy, he said, patting his chest. Muskogee Creek, like you. Like me, I thought. Right. I nodded again. Teacher here is old, but she's a good egg. Uh-huh, I said as we walked through the door. Got your English book? I shook my head. He opened his to a page with the corner bent down. This old poem, he said, we had to read it. Today we talk about it. I looked at the page and smiled. I already knew that poem. Thanks, I said, as we took our seats. Oh, east is east, and west is west, and never the twain shall meet, Mrs. Teague read. She looked over the top of her thick glasses at the class. Who can tell me what that means? No answer. Does it mean that those from other lands can never get together, never understand one another? She was met by silence. No one was raising a hand, way different from my old white schools where those who knew an answer would be just about dislocating their arms, waving to get the teacher's attention. Mrs. Teague's gaze settled on Tommy. Mr. Wilson, she said, stand up. Tommy stood, an uncomfortable look on his face. Yes or no? Tommy looked over at me. I'm not sure why. I lifted one finger from my desk and then dropped it. He looked back at the teacher. Yes, he said, his voice barely audible. Mrs. Teague smiled. Good. Now why? The uncomfortable silence that followed was even longer. Tommy wrapped his hands together and squeezed so hard that his knuckle popped. I raised my hand. Mrs. Teague looked at me. New student, she said, pointing a short finger at my chest. Can you tell us why? Stand. I stood as Tommy sat, letting out a sigh as he sank back into his chair. The next lines, I said. Really? Mrs. Teague said, a skeptical smile on her face. Yes, ma'am. Are you certain? I nodded and then did something I could never do in my own voice, me being reticent to say more than a few words at a time. I recited Kipling's next lines of the Ballad of East and West from memory. Till earth and sky stand presently at God's great judgment seat, but there is neither east nor west, border nor breed nor birth, when two strong men stand face to face, though they come from the ends of the earth. 
They had earned some funny looks from the other students, along with a very big smile and a well done from Mrs. Teague. Right after the, that, the bugle sounded to mark the end of the hour. Muto, Tommy said to me under his breath as we left the classroom side by side. But he quickly peeled off as I turned to join up with possum and bear meat outside the academic building. You like him, that white boy? Bear meat growled, pretending he only spoke broken Indian English like Mr. Parker, the old Cherokee man who the who's the boy's advisor in building two. Huh? said Bear Meat. You like him, him, that white boy? He punched me in the shoulder, playful, but still like getting kicked by a mule. It's a big thing here, I knew now. Being labeled as a white student here at Chilagi was almost as bad as being seen as Indian in the white world. Maybe you were not in danger of being driven off your land or even shot, but you still might be made to feel like an outsider a lot of the time. I'd come to realize just how lucky I was not to be seen that way. But it still didn't mean that I felt good about seeing people treated bad just for being born who they were. He's okay, I said, rubbing my shoulder to try to restore some feeling in it. It's Dahitki, said Grasshopper as he and Little Coon joined us. Grasshopper is the narrow-faced boy in Bear Meat's gang who was always chewing on something. Grass, tree rosin, Wrigley spearmint gum, paper. Then spitting it out like that insect. As if to live up to his nickname, Grasshopper ejected from his mouth a piece of the eraser he'd just gnawed off his pencil. White boys no belong here. At least it's better than being Stalutsky, Bear Meat chuckled. In it, Lil Coon. Little Coon, whose name on the school records is Lewis Oliver, pretended not to have heard him. Of all the boys in what I suppose I can now call our gang, me being included now, Lewis seems the most thoughtful and the most sensitive. He's also the one most likely, too, to do something diverting or funny whenever things get too serious. Oh my, Little Coon said, turning to direct our attention east. Take a look at what those old turkey buzzards are doing. Just a circling over the old lockup like they thought it was something dead. Maybe, Possum said, rubbing the scar on his cheek with one finger, a gesture he seems to make without knowing he's doing it. Old HD is over there and those buzzards, being close relatives of his, are swooping in for a family reunion. We all laugh, but it's not all that funny. That head disciplinarian is no laughing matter. I've felt his gaze settle on me a time or two during the short period I have been here. I bet he wishes the new rules brought in by Superintendent Morell weren't in effect. Horse whipping and the like are forbidden now. I know that for a fact because just yesterday the HD grabbed Grasshopper, who was chewing gum, out of line at the morning roll call. You, he roared, lifting Grasshopper up by his collar with his left hand as if he weighed no more than a puppy. The man's face was red as a beet. He raised up his big flat right hand. The big ring the HD wears on his right hand glinted as it caught the light of the rising sun. That ring had slipped around on his finger so that it was just inside his palm. Slap a man's face with a ring turned that way, and it'll leave a gash. Out of the corner of my left eye, I saw the look on Possum's face, and I knew right then who my friend Scar came from. Possum looked ready to step in. If he had, I would have been right beside him. Mr. Boehner, it was Superintendent Morell. His calm voice made the HD stop, close his palm, hiding the sharp-edged ring. He lowered Grasshopper back to the ground and turned toward his boss. Yes, sir, he said. Caught this one chewing gum. Superintendent Morell nodded. Cannot have that, he said. Rules are rules. He looked at Grasshopper, who was standing head down between the two of them. Spit it out in your hand. Grasshopper did just that. Now, stick it onto your nose and leave it there for the rest of the morning. It was clear from the look on the HD's face that he was not happy about being stopped, but he went along with it. Well, Grasshopper spent the rest of the morning standing at attention, the gum stuck on his nose, and a sign reading gum chewing is a filthy habit hung around his neck. The only good thing about it, he said later, was it was more interesting than Miss, Mr. Pond's class that he got to miss. Mr. Pond is the math teacher here at Jalagi. He's a big horse-faced man, 
In the classroom where he's supposed to be teaching, he hardly looks at any of us. Instead, at the start of each class, he writes a bunch of problems on the board. Do these, he says in his deep, sarcastic voice, though I doubt any of you dummies can. Then he sits down, takes a swig of the cough medicine he keeps locked in the middle drawer of his desk, leans back in his chair, folds his hands over his chest, closes his eyes, and goes to sleep until just before the bell rings. That's when Mr. Pond wakes up, sort of gradual, stands, stretches, and points to his desk. You idiots! Put your papers there. Now get out of here. I hate seeing the others treated that way even more than I hate being treated like a moron myself. It's not right. I think back to what it was like when I was on the road with Pop. There was none of that back then. Pop would not allow it. And more often than not, it was true of the majority of men who were hobos, true knights of the road. Thinking that makes me ache to be on the road again. Living that free life, feeling the wind in my face as I leaned out, the bo out of a boxcar while Pop was fixing up grub behind me. What a life that was. Even though Pop's aim was to have a us a farm of our own again, I have to admit that I hardly ever thought about being back on our farm after our first month of riding the rails together. If it wasn't for my promise to Pop, I'd be having serious thoughts right now of heading for the hills. Or, to be more accurate, the rail yard. There's one in the nearest town where we got off with the horses, the one Pop and I walked from. Unlike other kids who have run away in the past, no one would be able to predict where I was headed. I'd be on the first fast freight, a hundred miles gone, before they knew I was missing. According to Possum, more Indian kids have run away from Chilagi than have ever actually graduated. That ratio may be sort of skewed, seeing as how there are a bunch of kids like Pop who ran away again and again. Back about four years ago, Possum said, they tried punishing kids who run away more than once by expelling them. Think of that, punishing someone by telling them they can't come back to the place they was trying to escape in the first place, Possum chuckled. Like old rabbit said, please don't throw me into that briar patch, Mr. Bear. That expulsion policy ended when CB and a group of school staff, all former students themselves, asked for a meeting with the old superintendent. Giving a boy what he wants isn't what we'd call punishment, they pointed out. Why, I never thought of that that way, was his response. The expulsion policy for runaways was abolished the next day. To be fair, there are some here, more than you'd think, who actually chose to come to an Indian school. Bad as a lot of the so-called education is here, Chilagi, like Pop said, is first rate when it comes to teaching farming. Some Indian students who have gone here, I'm told, are managing to do a lot better at farming and stock rearing using the modern methods they learned here. There are other reasons why some Indian families, especially those who were at Chilagi, especially those who were Chilagi students themselves, have sent their children here. They've done it to give them a sense of belonging. Skinny's one of them. He's never tried to run away. Where would I run to, he said. Back where my family lived, we were the only Indians for miles around. The one school I went to, I was the only one with a brown face. I had to put up with other kids war whooping when they saw me. Called me Sitting Bull, asked me, asking where my teepee was. Around here, nobody treats me like I'm a wild Indian or a freak. Plus, I got football here. Little town where my family lives don't have enough kids for to form a team. Being accepted as an Indian... That's what a lot of the kids here feel good about. And that's what some wish they could be. Those mentioned early. Stahitskis and Stalutskis. White kids and black kids. Especially the Stalutskis. Too dark to pass for white, they might do be better in this world by passing as Indian. Phonies. Trying to get free room and board and an education all paid for by the government. That's how Bear Meat sees the darkest-skinned students here. Others, like Little Coon and Possum, are nowhere near so judgmental. Being my pop's son, I fall on their side of the issue. As far as I'm concerned, it's what a man does and not how he looks that counts. I doubt that most of them are really fakers. They just come from families where there's both Indian and some other blood, just like me. 
As far as the real dark ones are concerned, like some of those Cherokees from North Carolina, runaway slaves got adopted and mar married in over the years. Actually, though those words, Tahitki and Stalusti, Stalusti, get spoken now and then, it seems like no one ever goes out of the way to be mean to those labeled that way. They just don't always get invited into other groups like our Creek Gang. And in school activities like athletics or drilling, everyone gets treated alike. If some boy who's real black looking is a good football player, like Will Homer from Louisiana, who's the starting right tackle, you can bet he is going to be welcomed on the school team. Still, as I enter the mess hall with my friends, I can't help but notice that two tables, one in the boys' section of the huge mess hall and one in the girls' side, are occupied entirely by those dark-skinned kids labeled as Stalusti.